right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. For those that don't know me, I'm Angie Jones. I'm director of the Family Business Center here at the University of Toledo. And today's webinar is going to focus on an issue that is on everyone's mind these days. We hear this uh, topic a lot from our members. Um, how do you supercharge your sales team? So how do you find the right fit people? How do you incentivize? How do you motivate them? So this was already a challenge going into the pandemic and that added, um, the pandemic added a completely new set of challenges uh, for our sales leaders. So to tackle this issue, we assembled a rock star panel of, you know, rock star women, which I love. We have an all women panel today um, for a conversation, including advice, tips, incentives, and best practices for people leading their sales team. So our panel today from our educational professional sales here at the University of Toledo, we have Peter Jones, director of the program, Laura Parent, who's part of the faculty, Emily Brown, who's a current student graduating this May, which will be great for her to give the student perspective, and Heidi Joy Harnegy, who is an alum of the program and director of strategic execution with center member Buckeye Broadband. So this is going to be conversation style. I'm going to throw out some questions and see where it takes us. And then if you have any questions, you know, feel free to put them in the chat feature. We'll monitor those as we go. And if it's an in-depth or a situational question or something that just might not get your point across by me reading it, just flag us. You can either flag myself, Kirsten Luffler, or Emily Waggy, or just flag us in the chat and say that you would like to ask it yourself, and then we'll call on you. So... Um, we are recording this session, so it will be available on our um, YouTube page afterwards, and we will share the link out if there's some good tips in here that you want to share with a colleague or any other sales leaders you know. So we will go right into it, and I will put this out to the entire panel. Um, what are best ways to attract good fit salespeople? And I think acknowledging what a good fit is an important piece of the puzzle. So anyone want to start with that one? Um, Angie, I can kind of kick stuff off. I love the fact that we're using the term good fit on the sales talent because salespeople in particular, you know, you're ideally as a salesperson, you're coaching on, you know, finding good fit customers. So that would in turn mean you need good fit salespeople. And so, because salespeople specifically, they do not want to feel like they're just a body or a number at your organization. So that's going to be important. Um, you know, one of the things that we take a look at is there are different types of sales roles. And just because someone is a good sales professional or wants to be in professional selling, it does not necessarily mean they would be a good sales rep for your organization and or the type of sales cycle that your organization has. We end up challenging all of our students using the HR challenge um, assessment. It's a predictive assessment that has students compared against the six most common different types of sales profiles. And there are other assessments as well too, but typically what you're looking at is, you know, how long is the sales cycle going to be? How consultative is the cycle supposed to be? How much influence directly or indirectly does the sales professional have on the outcome of what's gonna be happening in the sales cycle? Level of complexity in terms of what they're gonna be selling. So those are all just a couple of different things you would want to take into account. I know myself, um, you know, I've challenged myself taking a look at different things. There are certain sales areas where you would never want to hire me in a million years to be a sales professional in certain areas because I, um, I want to move a little bit faster. Um, I might get impatient when dealing with things where I have indirect as opposed to direct influence. So those are areas where I would probably, you know, and just salespeople in general, it's important for the salesperson to know where they're going to be a good fit, but also for the organization to have a good sense of how their organization goes to market and what the expectation is for their salespeople that they're going to be hiring and what their day in and day out is going to be. And recognize that within their organization, you might actually need different types of salespeople based on what you're selling and who the customers are going to be. I think that's a really good point, Deirdre. And a lot of uh, times we think students are just driven by money. Um, and that's not necessarily the case a lot of times. Um, you know, I think a lot of people need to consider it's not just the monetary perks. There's a big shift to focus on culture. Um, and so a lot of times I'll tell students to, you know, look at the culture or look at some of the initiatives that this company is working on outside of maybe just sales um, to see if this is something that would be a good fit for you personally. Um, I think that's, that's very important when we're talking about what a good fit even is from the beginning. 
Great. So how do we, with such a nationally recognized sales program, how do our local, so our local businesses are competing against like the big corporate organizations for the best students, right? So what can they do to be noticed, you know, and how can they sell their opportunity? And maybe before we even go into the question part, take a minute or two, because it is a phenomenal program that we have here at the university. Maybe take a minute or two and talk a little bit about the program. Yeah, I mean, so with our, our Edgement School of Professional Sales, when we have an undergraduate um, degree, it's the major minors in professional sales. We actually have two different minor designations. We also have a sales concentration and we have an MBA concentration as well. Um, there's only two different universities in the entire country that has that level of depth at the undergraduate and at the graduate level um, with the professional sales program. So, um, you know, our students, I mean, they're getting, we're also the only university that has our students take a purchasing class to understand things from customer perspective. What a concept. I find a little nerve wracking that more colleagues aren't requiring customer perspective in that, in that, um, in, in taking a deeper dive in that respect. So, but I mean, I mean, we're graduating around two, well, we have a little over 200 students total in the program. We're graduating anywhere from 20 to 40 sales majors a semester in the program. And one of the things that we're really proud about is that our students, they work for a variety of different industries, a variety of different companies. We're about 50-50 on the relocation and we're defining relocation as a hundred miles or more from wherever our student calls home. Um, statistically, when you take a look at an Edgewood School student, we're 85% Ohio. Most of that is Northern Ohio, Central Ohio. We're 10% Southeast Michigan, and the remaining 5% pick a place. Um, so, I mean, but it's, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, the, the companies and, and what they're looking at, it's, I mean, yeah, we're a destination um, university for a variety of different organizations, small, medium, large. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is, very few students come into the Edgewood School of Professional Sales with a very specific mindset of, I'm going to work for a company, fill in the blank. You know, a lot of times they just know they want to be in sales. And, you know, to a point Laura made earlier, you know, they, they're looking for a certain type of impact or they have an expectation on a certain type of customer relationship that they're going to have. Some of them come to us thinking, that they're going to be in a car or getting on a plane on a regular basis because they're going to be out in the field and others are sitting there thinking they're going to have more of an office type of a job and, and more of an inside sort of a role. So they come to us with different expectations and we try to help to reset some of those expectations because some of them need to understand that sales is more broad than what a lot of them realize when they first get into the sales program. And part of how we're doing that is, you know, first off, every member of the sales faculty team We've all been in sales in some way, shape, or form, some of us more directly than others. Um, but, you know, we, we have a very extensive corporate partner community that, you know, we're using as examples in the classroom when, we share, when we're sharing stories, our own personal examples, but also the examples of what our corporate partners are experiencing out in the field. We, our partners come in to do classroom um, presentations or Q&A sessions with the students. They're role-playing with the students. We're actually getting ready to do our corporate coaching sessions next week. All of our brand new juniors are they're doing their very first role play next week. It's exciting and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> and then following their role plays the next class period after, they're gonna have a corporate coach who's going to sit down and go John Madden on that role play with them. You know, Ask them how they thought it went, but then provide them with some feedback. We do an internal competition, a national sales competition and various formal and informal networking events um, with their, their combination of open networking and then structured talks. So we spend a lot of time trying to help the students have a much broader understanding of what professional sales is, because we want them to go into the career itself and to the different organizations eyes wide open and understanding what they're getting themselves into. We require the students to have an internship before they graduate. We, we bake in um, a, a job shadowing opportunity in our sales strategies and technologies class because we want them to totally understand what it is that they do. And the College of Business and Innovation provides a wonderful job fair twice a year to supplement all of that, resume critiques, mock interviews, um, and, and stuff. So it's we're doing a, a variety of different things to help them understand what that good fit is and how they should be engaging. Okay. Emily, I'd like to get your student perspective on this. So can you share a little bit of um, what the students kind of when companies should start engaging students, uh, what your ex what your expectations are, what maybe other companies are doing um, to kind of schmooze you their way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, you know, like Deirdre was saying, it's really important to try to show up for those things like the job fair, you know, be involved with handshake, you know, the the 
different resources that we utilize to be able to connect with the students. I think, you know, it's it's a great idea to start connecting with those students as early as, you know, freshman or sophomore year, because then you can kind of shape them and see, you know, if they would be that good fit going back to that, that cultural piece to see whether or not they would like to learn and grow with the company. One benefit that, you know, smaller, potentially local companies have over these big, huge corporations is that if you get, you know, a student intern, they might be really excited because they could touch a lot of different areas other than sales and they could get a lot of different learning experiences within that smaller company that they may not be able to touch, you know, in, in a larger organization. So, you know, really looking for those learners, those those driven sales students that, that they want to learn and touch, you know, a, a variety of the areas in the business, I think is um, a big advantage that the smaller local companies have over those big companies. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, sophomore sophomore year is a great chance to try to you know reach out and grab those students and get them to commit to you and get them to um kind of just learn about the company a little bit and, and be able to you know discuss those things with them discuss future internship opportunities um growth opportunities entry-level positions all that kind of stuff just to be able to you know firmly grasp in their learning and be able to grow with them as a company you know, I'd like to maybe piggyback off of that and to say that a small or local business should not be maybe afraid to approach some of these students as well, because just because we have these big corporate partners with big names and, you know, brand recognition um, doesn't necessarily mean that your company is out of the running. Uh, you know, while the student might not know you by name, they will have likely interacted with your products on a daily basis. Um, or have dealt with your service at some point in their career or, or purchased it at some point. So recognizing that it's not just uh, the brand name that gives you the sales experience or, or the, the internship credit that you're looking for, um, but it's, it's the output of that um, is really the return, you know, that the student really needs to, to get a kind of 360 viewpoint, like Emily said, uh, of the business. So really having the ability to look at the variety and experience maybe a lot more in depth at a smaller uh, size company, it can be 10 times more beneficial than, you know, sticking to your lane at a, a, a larger company, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that hands on students, I mean, it amazes me, they'll go to like a larger organization, they'll come back and like, I could talk to the president of the company, they came in and they did a session with the interns. And I'm sitting there thinking, if you were at a different company, like that'd be your every day. Like, like, what don't what don't you understand? And stuff. So but that's but that's why we try to make sure that they're getting exposed to a variety of different opportunities. Because like Emily said, being hands on, and also I mean, as a, as a, someone that's in the Toledo area, you can intern these students year round. You know, and some of these organizations, they they can only intern somebody full time in the summer, and that's it. And you know, you're they're completely leaving on the table that you've got part time of, around their class schedule sort of availability. So that is that is huge. I mean, there are some some large local players that can do part time flexible around class schedules during the regular academic semester, but a lot of organizations are not in that position and so small and medium sized organizations in this little area are in an amazing opportunity to, you know, have a seat at the table. Okay, you mentioned um, two things I want to follow up on. You mentioned Handshake, which I'm familiar with because I'm part of the university, but I don't know if all of our members are. So one, could I ask you to talk a little bit about that? And then maybe we can find a link to put in a, the chat feature and to tell them how they can get connected with Handshake. And then a question that I hear a lot is, I would love to take on an intern, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's requirements, how to set up that program. It seems like a lot of work. I don't know what to pay them. So it just seems like it's too much and that's why they don't do it. So I don't know if you offer any guidelines or if you have any resources online or maybe best practices, here's what the going rate is that we could share with them as well. Yeah, so Handshake, it's first off, Handshake is, a, is an excellent tool, but it's also a beast. <laughs> um, I say that because the power of Handshake is when you, it's just how you fill out a job posting and then you, you get approved by the university and then it gets posted and all the students at University of Toledo can see it. The good news, bad news is that companies will have a handshake account. And then when they post that job, if they are approved at multiple universities, that job will post simultaneously everywhere. So right now in the University of Toledo's handshake system, for example, there's over 500 sales jobs. 
that's a lot. Um, the students are never going to read all of those job postings. They're never going to look at all of them, you know, and I'll let Emily speak as to, you know, what the students are actually doing in Handshake. I have my spidey senses on what's going on and pretty good insight, but I'll let Emily speak more, more to that. But the thing is, going to, you know, some stuff that folks were mentioning earlier, the students are going into Handshake to apply for the jobs for the companies that they talk to at the Schmidt Schools Networking Night or the college's job fair, or that talked to their student organization or came in to talk to their sales class. That's what they're looking to do. They're looking specifically for companies that have already previously engaged through the college, the Schmidt School and or student organizations. That's what they're looking to do because they're not gonna look at 500 jobs in Handshake. They just won't. So um, yeah, so what was the other part on, on that Angie was, it was on Handshake. And then an internship, you know, is there any I guidelines guess. on how to set up an internship? Um, I don't know if the students typically want it for credit, if there's any guidelines on here's uh, a, the going um, rate of pay or compensation. Yeah, so I mean, and, and I mean, and Laura sees a ton of different students, you know, with their internships as well, too. But typically, I mean, from a pay perspective, they're getting paid on average $12 an hour plus commission. And so you know, I mean, it definitely pay them because there are more than enough organizations that are going to pay the students. And even though money isn't everything when they're a college student, money is a lot because they've got to, you know, pay bills. What's great about a University of Toledo student is that the, I think we're at like 75%, if not 80% of University of Toledo students are financing their own college educations. And they're working while they're going to school, some of them part-time, some of them full-time. And so you need to pay them because they will find, they'll find another internship that's just as good, if not better, and they'll actually get paid. So if you're not paying, you're, you're dead on arrival um, with it. Also, um, there needs to be some sort of like base telling them that they're gonna be commission only. That just doesn't fly anymore, um, whether it's internship or post-graduation, because once again, there's enough other organizations that are willing to pay them, even if it's a starter salary, and a salary that gets smaller over time once they get a better book of business, they become more proficient. Um, students are very reluctant um, post-graduation to take anything that has um, that is 100% pure commission. So, but in terms of the stuff that you can have the interns do, it's um, it, you don't have to get fancy with it. You know, it's <laughs> the students they're looking for hands-on experience, and it's going to be a combination of hands-on, but also some job shadowing. If it's too hands-on and there's never any shadowing, the students are gonna get probably get burned out and scared because they don't necessarily know what they should be doing. So you need to bake in some shadowing so they can see someone in action to know what they should be doing. Um, but you also need to put them in the driver's seat at some point. And please do not feel that they are going to be selling key accounts or they're gonna be important in front of important customers. You give them the small stuff, give them like service contracts, renewals, um, training, or like entry level products or services that you have that's like the easy early on stuff and and they also don't have to be involved with the whole sales cycle it could be just sales support for a while uh, maybe they're helping out with some quoting you know um, and then there are just shadowing for the rest of, of the opportunity as well too but also make sure you're being very transparent with them on what the sales cycle looks like we really coach our students to ask questions about what the sales cycle looks like because as everyone knows that's ever been in sales, like you feel defective at some point. Um, you absolutely feel defective at some point. You're like, what am I doing wrong, right? And as faculty, you know, we give the students feedback next class period, the following week on how they did. They are accustomed to getting feedback on a regular basis. And then all of a sudden you get in sales and people don't return phone calls or emails. And you're sitting there thinking like, oh my God, I'm doing something wrong. And so helping them understand what the cycle looks like and what the steps are and approximately how much time each one of those um, phases is going to take that's really helpful to help them get through that just that mental part in sales where they don't feel like they're they're completely messing something up and like they should pack up so other things that we see happen in internships are like special projects you can include some sort of a special project that's done separately from regular sales cycle work and i'd be careful on what that sales project is going to be because if the internship is too much about the special project and not enough about the sales cycle the student's gonna feel like, what did I actually learn? How do I really know what my everyday is gonna look like if I stay on with this company? So, and then also with the sales cycle, um, you know, even though I, I'm encouraging folks to give them things that are a little bit 
shorter, easier, something that they can sink their teeth into a little faster, make sure that at some point in time during the internship, they're getting some sort of exposure to that next phase or that next more complex product or service. Because if you make the internship two rainbows and unicorns, they're going to sit there and think, I know this is harder than that. And they're, they're going to feel nervous because they want to know what's going to happen next and what the challenges are going to be. And if they never felt defective enough <laughs> at some point, they're not necessarily going to know how well equipped they are to handle the next level with your organization. So it's, it's definitely all a balancing act. I think we are also gone from the day of students only doing one internship. Yep. Um, students are doing multiple internships and also students are talking about their internships with other students. And so it's very important to have a meaningful program, um, a meaningful experience that you're continually developing, um, you know, reworking, showing students multiple aspects of the business, uh, mm -hmm. because if not, you know, others in the program are going to start finding out about it uh, and they're not going to want to come to your company. So I think that's also key is, you know, from our side, control maybe the chatter, but also from the company side as well, you know, make sure you're constantly reevaluating the program and making sure that not only is it beneficial to you to have the student on and helping you, but that they're getting some sort of meaningful learning opportunity as well that will want to keep bringing people back. I think that's kind of the idea of retention as well, right? Is, mm -hmm. is how do we keep them happy? How do we keep them coming back? Um, and it all starts with, you know, getting them in younger, earlier, and develop, developing them in the program along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And with that earlier point, I don't know how many people that are listening in today are parents and what age your, your, your children might be, but that part of why it's so important to identify them earlier is because of what's going on in the K-12 sector. Um, these students are taking, I mean, even my own kid, um, young man, <laughs> um, I mean, he's taking college credits. He's already taken college classes because they can get, they can take AP classes and then they take a test at the end and they get college credit based on their test score. They can take college credit plus some of that they're taking at their high school. Sometimes they're physically coming on campus and then there's post-secondary where they're coming on campus. It is not unusual, especially when you have the more talented, highly driven students, they will come in, they will be a freshman for like a hot second, and then they're already a sophomore. So these students are matriculating faster because of what's going on in the K-12 sector, and they're coming in more prepared. I mean, we're, all, we're already making, and we have been making adjustments to the professional sales program, recognizing the fact that these students, they're coming in with, with some of these skill sets already in place because of things that are happening in high school. Um, you take a look at other high school organizations and classes like DECA and BPA, Business Professionals of America. That's a great, I mean, I cannot begin to tell you how well DECA students and BPA students do in um, the John and Lillian Neff College of Business and Innovation. They do fantastic. These students are already hardwired. They come in with already a semester under their belt just by virtue of what they're doing in those classes. Mm -hmm. I will say I am a DECA graduate as well. So yes, I can, I can attest to it. It's, it's really great. And like you were saying, Georgia, you know, their speed going through this. So then by the time that you may want to get to them, they're already taken up, you know, yeah. if they get to that junior or senior year, they're already coming in with all of these credits. So um, yeah, definitely the earlier you can start, the better. I think that you also have an upper hand in that sense, you know, being mm -hmm. a smaller, medium sized company is some larger organizations may have, you know, requirements on you must be a junior, a senior, whatever age it might be. So you can kind of nab up those, those younger gems quickly and, and help to um, build them and develop them and, and help grow with the program and the company. Yeah. Yeah. Because like Laura said earlier, these students are getting multiple internships before they graduate. Um, in terms of getting the actual academic credit, um, and the professional sales program in the College of Business at Utilita, we're the only ones that require an internship before graduation. Others strongly encourage it. 85% of all College of Business and Innovation students will do an internship before they graduate. But I mean, we are looking at how hands-on is the internship, is it customer facing, hopefully, you know, and, and it's, if it's too much of shadowing, we're gonna let you know and, and then reject the internship. But from an academic perspective, the students for the credit portion, they have to have completed their basic sales class prior to doing the internship, if the student wants to get academic credit for that internship. So for some students, they're not gonna care. Um, they'll, they'll, they won't be as concerned as to whether or not the internship's been 
pre-approved or how well the internship aligns with certain things that the sales program is looking for because the student might be looking for a particular type of experience, industry, organization. Because um, some of the students, you know, especially if they're looking for multiples, they'll be very methodical. They'll say, well, my first internship is going to be an inside sales. And then my second internship is going to be field sales. Or they're specifically trying to get into two different industries because they, they're trying to learn. They just want to figure out what's going to be a good fit for them so they can make the best possible choice um, when, by the time graduation approaches. Great. So I want to ask now Heidi Joy, and I love that you're on our panel because you're from a center member, so you're very representative of our audience. Um, what luck have you had attaining a, a sales team? And are you, is your company typically going after the, the current college students that are about to graduate, or are you looking more um, for seasoned salespeople who have a lot of experience under their belt? Yeah, good question. And I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I came up under Deirdre and actually Laura, I think you were just coming on board uh, when I was there as well. And I can tell you that so much of what I learned and studied has carried me through with my career. Now I'm with Buckeye Broadband um, here in the area. And from BNL whoops, 28 CJS. I talk too loud. My uh, <laughs> Alexa in my office gets really excited. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what we have found with recruiting, and when I talk to our hiring managers, the first thing I find is that they don't understand hiring salespeople, you've got to be a salesperson. You, you, you know, they want to be won over, they want to be wooed. And in part of that, I relate it to dating. Deidre did that in the sales college where we had speed dating. Uh, for hiring. And I, and it started to like click in my mind as I got into our organization as well as hiring is so much like dating, you know? Um, and, and right now, when you think of college students, what they're used to, a lot of the dating starts at the very beginning, like on an app, right? Where they're filling out applications, but in order to win someone over, it's the relationship. Um, and, and how you get the foot in the door is the self-awareness. So for our hiring managers, part of it is to say, what's your elevator pitch? How are you explaining our company in 30 seconds. You're going to lose their attention if you start rambling on or you can't say why my company is better than yours. Um, you, so you've got to know what your mission is. And then I actually role play with my own managers and I say, recruit me, recruit me, tell me why I'm coming to your team. And we go back and forth. And that's when we can kind of get that energy and that excitement around the position that, you know, that's where you want to pursue you know, the, um, the, the sales agents that you're going after, that's what makes a difference, what's going to set you apart. Uh, because right now, there's a lot of big data websites. You can do this, you can do Zip recorder, Recruiter, like all these million different things. But I believe students or we find a lot of entry level um, sales folks get lost in the shuffle. They can't tell the difference between this job and another. So I put the onus on my recruiting managers. I put it in their bonuses. And I said, look, the better retention you have, the more recruiting you have, um, the more successful we're going to be as a company. So I'm going to come alongside you and we're going to train and we're going to role play. And we really use a lot of the same tools that the sales college uses to teach um, the students. But uh, Roger mentioned it early on, knowing what you're looking for. We're looking for new. Um, we know competitively where we our pay range um, right at the beginning. So we want to get them when they're eager uh, and when they're excited to learn. And then our commitment to them is to say, we need four years out of you. That's what value looks like to us. But we can tell you at the end of that four years, this is what you're going to get with our organization. You're going to meet our president. You're going to be a part of our initiatives. You're going to understand our project pipeline, how we're innovating, how we're taking customers' feedback and putting that into the products you're selling. So um, we, we, we re, uh, reimburse their education. So a lot of them, if you want a higher education, work alongside with us, we'll invest with you. And so I think the more, just like with dating, the, more, the better self-awareness, if you know who you are, who your organization is, the better you can articulate that to your candidates, the, the, the better hire you're gonna have and the more attractive you're gonna be to those, to those folks. Yeah, no. Oops. So many job descriptions just blend together. Heidi Joy just hit it on the head because I'll read stuff and I'll be like, oh my God, this looks like everyone else's. <laughs> yeah. And you know what else? We actually, I don't know if everyone does this. We, we ask the candidates, what's the pay range you're looking for? Because if you're double my rec, <laughs> I'm not going to call you. 
uh, because it's going to waste my time and yours. But if you're like a little bit above, you better believe I'm going to call you and try to sell you and explain why staying here in Toledo mm -hmm. is, is the better bang for your buck. You may see those higher dollar um, salaries offered to you. But uh, the other advantage we have right now is people are getting out of the cities. You don't want to live there. COVID's been an awful time to live out there, you know, and, and they can't get to, you know, Toledo is amazing you know, what we've been able to keep doing here. And so positioning that in front of some folks and saying, hey, this is why I stay. This is why the company got me here. Um, the more you can get that out in front, um, the more I think you can convince people, you know, what you're aware of, what you're offering. Katie Joy, that's so spot on. You know, the person who's been in, the, in that company maybe for 20 years might be a good employee, but they're not the best at selling the company. And so, you know, you need to have the, the salespeople selling the company, selling the environment, um, yeah. you know, selling the opportunity um, because, because of the environment that we're in right now, it's that choice is going to be, you know, you're going to be pulled 10 times every direction. Yeah. So you're, you're going to need to have a strong pull um, and a strong sale right from the get go. Yeah, and I can tell you what we've told um, our folks too, because we have we have engineering and IT, and I say you're not everyone is a salesperson. That's you know the the sales skips, the things that we find is that everyone in this company, if we want to succeed, you better figure out what you're selling, and if if you're selling our company, um, if you're selling our products, those are all different, and you know and you'll be compensated differently for that. But um, yeah, so engineers, it's kind of saying how are you selling it. And make sure that we're we're working with them on that. But yeah, it's it's very it's intimidating for a lot of folks yeah. um, to explain it. The other thing is we have a referral bonus that we do for employees. A lot of again to incentivize. You might not be a hiring manager, but if you're sitting at a graduation party or if you're sitting in church and you hear that so and so's got someone, you know you need to be familiar with what positions we have open, because uh, you know we need our eyes and our ears. You know you can't just go through job postings. Um, to get people hired, you know, our best hires are usually through word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. And someone that says, I love working for this company. You know, if you could get your foot in the door, trust me, this is somewhere you're going to want to stay. Yeah. No, I mean, we see that also with the internships too, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. if your organization has enough work and can support two interns, go with two, because then you've got students that are palling around together at the internship. Then you've got two of them on campus talking to their peers about the things that are going on. And a lot of times the interns, you know, they, they feel a sense of responsibility and ownership on like, well, I'm getting ready to graduate or I'm getting ready to, you know, take on a full-time regular role with this organization. I want to find my replacement. Mm -hmm. And so that's once again, why that internship is so important, you know, and, and Heidi brings up another great source of sales talent at your organization, and that is the non-sales people. I believe 110%, you know, that everyone is in sales in some way, shape or form. And, you know, for some of your organizations, you know, if you're more technical in nature, you know, your technical subject matter experts, they're talking to customers on a regular basis. They are salespeople. And so sometimes, you know, think about the folks that you already have that have some degree of customer interaction. They're probably more sales than maybe what some of you are completely aware of. I mean, I married a scientist who did not believe he was in sales in any way, shape or form. And, you know, and he would come home, go, oh, customers are calling me, customers have this question, you know, and, you know, and then he would talk about how he knows more than the salespeople, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's like he could leverage all of that technical, you know, goodness that he had in his head to ask really good questions to the customer and to challenge the customer in a way when they really needed to be challenged about something that they should or shouldn't do because he had that technical background and he could pull that off and he knew which button to press, you know, on it. And he knew when to, you know, kind of digging in a little bit further when he needed to back off. And sometimes you're only going to get that with someone who's technical in nature. And so in some cases, you know, look at, I mean, we do have students from College of Engineering, College of Pharmacy, College of Arts and Letters, they are minoring in professional sales or they're minoring in business. And those are amazing individuals to get because they have wonderful depth in other areas, but they're bringing business acumen and or sales acumen to the table um, you know, and we're, we're and actually our strongest growth in the sales program is actually students from those other areas, always looking to continue to get more because there's just not enough of them. And that's the other part. There's not enough sales programs nationwide to keep up with the corporate demand. So looking at people you already have and recognizing the sales component uh, to their job, 
but also, you know, looking at other um, colleges and majors and then seeing which ones of those students are also doing something with a sales program or a college of business to help get those other pieces you're going to need for them to be, be successful. Thank you. So one thing that Heidi Jo said, or Heidi Joy said earlier um, about the city of Toledo and people moving back in or, you know, COVID has made you realize you don't need to be in the big city, pay the big city rent. Um, and there's so much, you don't need to be packed in, right? There's so much more opportunity here. I think in the past, a lot of people have seen in terms of recruiting is it Toledo as a deterrent. And I was just in a presentation and if you've seen all the stuff that they're doing downtown, that's not the case. I mean, that is such a cool place to be. So that's really exciting. And I think use that, you know, use that as an advantage to coming here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about commission structures um, and how to incentivize employees because this is a question we get a lot. You know, what are the trends in terms of this? Um, what are some maybe different structures that are more popular or, um, attracting different people yeah so and this is because there's a lot of info i'm gonna um you know if 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 it's all right to share my screen at some point uh, let me know if i can if i can do that um but just to broadly hit on um you know when it comes to compensation I mean, because we get asked this question all the time and the short of it is there is no silver bullet it does not exist. <laughs> There's no magic number. Um, but what, what's important to keep in mind is when you're looking at someone who's newer, especially someone who's gone through a university sales program, there needs to be some sort of base in place. And then there's commission or bonus on top of that. Um, a commission only structure is really not going to be great right out of the gate. You also need to think about how long your sales cycle is. If you're selling something that it's going to take nine, 12 months, 18, 24 months to close, you have absolutely got to give that person more of a salary than a commission. Because, you know, like Heidi talked about, it's the relationship. If you want your customer to establish, I mean, if you want your salespeople to establish relationships with customers and prospects, and you know full well that it's going to take you longer to, to close that sale, you don't want your salesperson to starve <laughs> while they're trying to close the sale. So, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and share share on this. So yeah, I mean, just to kind of see, these are some general rule of thumb um, on it. So you can kind of see what are some general things to think about, um, you know, with um, the whole salary versus commission um, aspect of it. So there needs to be some sort of um, linkage to results. You know, I like how, how Heidi was saying, I'm gonna compensate my hiring managers <laughs> On, 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 you know, on what they're actually trying to accomplish. And that's important to make sure that you're tying compensation to the results that you want. And so we're seeing some of them, you know, it's looking at, you know, activity, number of outbound calls, how much new business versus retaining existing business, because whatever system you put in place, salespeople, they're going to crunch the numbers and they're going to find out how much they can make. And if you change the compensation plan, are they going to make more or less money? based on what you've done. Um, if you ever tell someone it's uncapped income potential, I can tell you right away they're gonna be skeptical because they're like, okay, well, what's the market potential? It might be uncapped, but how much can I realistically make? So, you know, walking people through what the actual market potential is going to be so they can do the math to figure out these sorts of things. But, you know, I mean, when you're looking at salary, sales trainees and sales support need to be, you know, more so with that. You know, we typically recommend some sort of a combination plan between salary and commission structure. So um, some other things that, that you would see is, you know, once again, time frame offering, um, you know, also like how customizable is, is what you're, with what you're selling. If you are selling something that is pretty standard sort of a thing and it's, it's plug and play in terms of what they're selling, you can absolutely have a higher commission structure in place with something like that because that sale is easy to repeat because there's not, not much, there's not much customization going on with what you're selling. But if what you're doing is highly customizable, there's a lot of consultation going on, you're gonna to need to do something higher on the salary side and lower on the commission or bonus side of things. So um, another thing to take into consideration is how you're compensating other people on the team because salespeople are incentivized to sell and to sell certain things or like new products or exciting things that are coming out. But if the peop other people in your organization are not 
incentivized in a variety of different manners to fulfill orders quickly or to you know provide a certain service level or there's a certain timeliness it's 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 just going to like it's just going to hurt the sales professional's ability to get stuff done because the other people on the team are maybe all salary and there's no incentive or, or reason for them to go above and beyond to get certain things done a salesperson can sell it but then it won't get um it won't get supported it won't get delivered as such and then that salesperson's not going to want to sell in that area or with those products or services anymore because they're going to realize that it's an uphill battle to get other people on the team the non-sales folks to do what it is that they're supposed to be doing so um, also taking a look at how many accounts they're supposed to be managing and then the touch points with those accounts so if they have a, a large number of, of accounts probably it's more of a transactional relationship something that's more easy to repeat so you could do a heavier commission structure but if they're having once again fewer accounts more customization then I'm typically more on the on the salary side for that. But these are just some some generalities that can help with that process. So um, no silver bullet. <laughs> um, with that, um, just as a point of reference, the typical professional sales student from the University of Toledo first year out, when you're looking at all the financial compensation pieces, so salary plus commissions, bonuses, draws, whatnot, they're typically making just north of fifty six thousand dollars their first year out on the financial side of things. So, and then when you're looking exclusively at the salary component of that, the average salary first year out is $44,000. And that's once again, on average starting out. So we absolutely have students that are making 70, 80, $90,000 right out of the gate first year. And then there are others that will be, you know, more in, in, in the world of like the forties and stuff, um, total financial comp, we're absolutely coaching the students on culture and fit and ongoing career advancement because having a sales development program is another really important piece to this because sometimes people might freak out companies about, about the dollar amount or the job description. And we see them too many times trying to shove too much into that first year as opposed to realistically deconstructing what things are gonna look like um, over time and then adjusting the compensation accordingly. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback off of that too, I think there's important incentive pieces to look at that are non-monetary as well. So, you know, whether that is, you know, sales team dinners or sales conferences or, you know, the opportunity to have a mentor, um, you know, getting that, that, that feedback and being able to watch someone, I think that is very um, enticing for young sales students to be able to get that one-on-one -on -one relationship and have someone coach you, you know, in personal, professional, and help, help you develop in that way, um, you know, affinity groups, different things like that. So I think that those are some important things to take into consideration as well in terms of incentivizing as, um, you know, I think Laura said it earlier that not everything is about money as well although it's very important you know younger students these days they they want a little bit more they want the culture they want the right fit and all of that so i think that kind of rounds out the conversation in that sense so and and i think the other thing for us is that uh we had to kind of throw the book out the window with covid <laughs> so we had a we had a plan we had you know what we've been doing forever for your commission versus salary and kind of what works However, in sales, the game changed with COVID. So for example, you know, our one sector that focuses on small business sales, well, a lot of our small businesses closed. So if you had a commission, a higher commission pay plan, we had to separate motion versus action, um, you know, really look at our, our group and say, what does success look like as we're navigating through the pandemic? Um, a lot of times we'll look at their all in comp. So what were they hired? What was their like full compensation? And then you almost use like a, I kind of think of it as like a sliding scale that mix between 90, 10 um, versus 75, 25, 70, 30. What results do we need them to do? What's realistic? Um, I've got another sales team that's in our retail stores. Uh, so that significantly changed for them. That's more residential sales, transactional, uh, but traffic, traffic was, I mean, it was, it was, ter traffic was terrible. And then, in, in, you know, and then employees were wiped out. So we were closing locations left and right. So navigating that, you know, our commitment to our employees was to communicate through it and that, you know, and that we're all in this together and um, month by month, we're going to reassess and rebuild, you know, and keep people whole. And as the, the company succeeds, the team succeeds. So I think that was, that was really different in um, going through a, a 
pandemic with the sales staff was mm -hmm. was exciting. I think that's so true. Uh, it's all about the culture, promoting the team environment, um, especially now because uh, of so many unknowns in the environment and what your company has to play off of. And not everything's going to be the same as when you first start. But, you know, a lot of times larger companies, uh, sometimes all they can offer is that financial incentive. And so if you're in that bottom 10%, you're going to be cut from their team. Um, but possibly in these smaller companies where we have the ability to be flexible with maybe restructuring, um, if, if it's the incentive, if it's the, um, you know, the base, the, the commission, um, you know, they can still create a competitive environment while promoting the collaboration, not being so cutthroat, um, as long as they feel like they're making a difference, um, they're still getting the recognition for their efforts, uh, even though it is a really tough environment to be selling in, or if you have to shift uh, from a, a you know transaction based uh, to relationship based, or vice versa. So sometimes the larger companies lose out on that because they're just so focused on the development and the numbers, whereas maybe the, the smaller companies have this opportunity to really develop and foster other skill sets. Um, that you know, right now we're all doing multiple jobs. Um, and, you know, we're forced to be doing things that are outside of what we were originally hired for, what we were originally paid for. Um, and so I think that that piece is also very key in understanding, um, you know, incentive structures and, and um, being rewarded for that, right? There's so many more intrinsic rewards out there available for students these days that maybe are just not seen or discussed. So that communication piece is, is truly critical. Yeah. I mean, they're lifelong students and they want to continue to learn and grow and develop. They want to be challenged. And that's where, you know, something like a development program and, and some of you might be sitting there thinking like, oh gosh, you know, that sounds like work, <laughs> you know, to like put stuff together. But it's, it's actually fairly, I've got another visual just, just to help give folks a sense of some things to expect when we say, you know, what would a development program, you know, potentially look like. And it's, Think about this in terms of just a couple of years, you know, really take a look at that job description. And once again, as, as, as Laura and Heidi Joy and Emily have talked about, what do you actually really need them to do? And right now, like, like Heidi, like Heidi Joy is doing with her team, let's, let's, let's take that step back and figure out what is it that we really need to have happen and who are the customers that they're actually going to be dealing and interacting with. And then just say, here's your year one, your year two, your year three. And these, and keep in mind, these are, these are just, you know, this is just generic for illustration purposes, but you could look at this as three months, six months, nine, 12, 18 months, 36 months. It all depends once again on your organization, your sales cycle and what they're looking at. You know, and, and Laura touched on this, you know, there's uncertainty that they're dealing with and laying out some sort of a development program for them so that you can give them a sense of these are the ways in which we're going to continue to develop you and challenge you over time. Because the last thing so many of, 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 of younger people, what they want to do is get out and then just feel like they're just going to park it somewhere. And then whether it's a, it doesn't matter what the company size is, they don't want to park it somewhere and then just live out the rest of their life, like doing the same thing all the time. They want to know, they need to know that they're going to be challenged and they get to grow over time. So you take a look at stuff in year one, you know, having them deal with existing accounts, maybe accounts that are smaller. You know, and some of this, there's some things that, you know, maybe I mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of development programs and internships, but, you know, they want to know, like, and the thing is, you can give them a particular title and job description and compensation that's just for that first year and be very candid about this is what year one or the first six months or 18 months, this is what life looks like. And then once you know, because it's your organization, you know what the day in and day out is going to look like. You know what your sales cycles are going to look like, the different types of customers you're interacting with. And then say, okay, what's the next phase look like? And approximately when does that happen? Does it change in terms of who the customer is? Does it change in terms of the types of products or services that they're going to be selling? And if there's little bits of changes to their job description, let's make note of that. Let's change the title a little bit. Let's change the compensation a little bit. And sometimes it could be big changes. Sometimes it could be small changes. But the key is you've got, and, and there's a great term for this that they came up. Um, I forget who actually had coined the term years back, but they called it adult lessons because <laughs> they graduate and they're still in that, that, that fun in-between stage. 
And so having development programs helps them with that in that adoles adolescence period to kind of get into that groove of, you know, regular life, so to speak, um, because you're baby stepping them into the diff different ways that their sales job is going to grow or evolve or change. And what it does is they, they end up feeling, I got a promotion. I'm doing such a good job. I get to deal with different customers now, right? And it parallels some of the things that larger organizations are doing as well too. Smaller organizations can absolutely do the exact same thing. You just got to peel, peel away the, the layers of the job description and who your customers are. I love that graphic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, Deirdre, you had a term that you used um, in our conversations is career lattice. And mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? And is that more of the trend now than climbing the career ladder? Absolutely. I mean, and this is something, you know, I mean, I think, you know, Emily, Lauren, Heidi Joy have all hit on this as well, too, is the fact that just because you start in sales, you start as a sales rep, your next move, maybe you're going to be, you know, a higher level sales rep, or you're going to be a, a specialty rep, right? You're going to work with a particular vertical or different type of customer, but you can also, I mean, get into key account sales, get into national accounts. Some people go from sales and they end up getting a marketing job afterwards, or maybe they get into a training and development role to train and develop the new hires that are going to be coming in. And something that we see as really successful in sales development programs is this whole you're training the per, you're training your replacement, and this is, this is ongoing. You know, it's a coach sort of a role. You don't necessarily have to give someone a leadership position for them to be a coach. You know, because sometimes it's it's the person that's sitting next to you or down the hall, or maybe you know, in a field based situation, they're obviously like completely physically separate than you. But think about what are the ways that you can have people coach each other. Because you can, you can be an absolute fantastic coach, but it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that you need to be in a leader, a formal leadership type position. Um, and people will still feel fulfilled, challenged, excited about their job. And yeah, if you're giving them some coaching responsibility, maybe you change their comp just a little bit. Um, but it's, it's important to think about, you know, as a, you know, if anyone's done gardening with the lattice, right, you can make lateral sideway moves, you make diagonal moves. It's not necessarily about climbing up this ladder on like, well, I've been a rep for a certain amount of time. I need to be managing a team now. That's not, that's not the way the students are, are looking at things. And that's, and frankly, we're, we're reprogramming them to think about making those, those lateral moves or how they can grow or evolve within a sales career without having to leave an organization. You know, maybe you're, you, they can head up. I mean, you think about the amazing things that Heidi Joy's done over at Buckeye. I mean, you think about the different types of sales roles that are now created in the different markets that you serve now over at Buckeye. You know, and a lot of that thanks to the ideas and stuff that you had. I mean, Heidi could probably give some great examples on, on things in terms of how you can grow within your sales role. Yeah, well, and, and some, some tools that we use, because part of that is just making sure that you're having the conversations with your top 30%. A lot of times um, our managers get really focused on the bottom 20. They, you know, it's that 80-20, like the, the, the bottom 20 suck all of your time. You're trying to coach and get your bottom 20 better. We kind of say, hey, there's there's pips for that. There's pips like get them out the door. You know, if they're if they're disengaged and they're not enchanted, I mean, you're wasting your time. But if you look at your top 30%, those are the folks that we want to promote and build into other areas into our company. Two tools we do, um, it, we try to do them quarter, quarterly. Would be um, an exercise where you sit down with them and you say, um, it's the whole start, stop, continue. Um, hey, what's something you want us um, to stop doing? What do you think we should start doing? What do you want us to continue doing? How do we keep, keep building value? Something that's different than what's connected to their commission. That kind of starts to incentivize that entree leadership. Like if this is your business, what would you start? What would you stop? What would you continue? Um, we steal a lot of those ideas and then they love it. They love when we can incorporate their ideas into the organization. They realize they're making a difference and then they're also more engaged. Um, and then it's kind of a piece of that is something called a stay interview. You know, we all, uh, we try to do exit interviews when people, again, when they fire us, when they leave us, why did you leave? Why were you sad? What can we fix? Um, but ultimately a stay interview is something that we invest in, in the top 30%. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's all documented. And then that way, when we go through it, that's something that I review with my managers is what is it going to take to get your top 30% to stay? Is it, you know, is it that path to promotion? Has it been fully defined? Is it discussed? Is it mentoring? Is it education? What are those elements? Is a work-life balance? 
Could we talk about working remote? You know, what are those elements that we can look at um, that'll help engage them and keep us with the organization um, and make sure that, you know, from our goal is, is ultimately to promote from within first. And, uh, and so then when we can pull up the talent, um, you know, we're all the better for it. It's a lot easier to promote uh, than to do out external hiring for higher up in management. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think those are, it's an important process to go through that whole, you know, what, what should I start doing? What should I stop doing? Because I, you know, I've seen some alums, you know, and even like some seasoned folks like leave different organizations and it's like, they're, and it's just like they're, the things that would have kept them, just listen to them, you know, <laughs> I mean, like ask them basic questions. I mean, I think about, and granted this is a large organization, but I think of, you know, Rocket Mortgage and the Quicken Loans family of companies. The reason they are a family of companies, this did not happen overnight. They do exactly the things that Heidi was talking about. Why are you staying? They deliberately give their employees time to dream and to work on pet projects and what are ideas and things that you have. And then when they have ideas, that's why there's all those different rock companies. <laughs> it's because they got ideas from their employees and then they rolled it out and then they put that person in charge of it or let them have a key role in it. It's yep. like yeah. dating. <laughs> I think also what we see too is that uh, sometimes as an employee, we have a different mindset of where we want to go and managers have a different idea of where they want their employees to go. And so if you're not transparent, uh, then oftentimes you're too late and it's not communicated until after the fact. So then you're stuck with somebody, a disgruntled employee who <laughs> um, is leaving and, you know, has a potential to, to ruin the chances of somebody else maybe great coming in. Um, or just self-sabotaging your own team. Um, and so that communication piece is really key to, you know, talk all the time, you know, career paths can evolve, um, you know, goals can evolve and change. And it, you should always be having these developmental discussions to try to retain people um, because we're all different, you know, motivations are so different across the board. And I think that's what makes teams and the ability to to play and work off of each other so great. Yeah, that's the good news, bad news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is fabulous. Um, I, I love the concept of the stay interview versus the exit interview, you know, focus on the positive and, and flip it and be proactive versus reactive. So we are at the end of our hour. Um, so I wanted to um, thank all of our panelists. We really appreciate you being here today and, and providing um, your valuable input and perspectives. And I think just for um, another perspective, Emily, you, you're graduating in May. You've already have a job lined up. And how long have you had that job lined up for? Since uh, July, actually. But that was, a, that was, it would have been August had it not been pandemic situation, but since July, yeah. See, they, they get a, almost a full year before she graduates. So they get the yeah. good students early. So, and that kind of going back to that, make sure that you, if you're looking for the right out of college students, you make sure you engage, get in front of them, get your name out and sell yourself, right? There's lots of great benefits from working in a, a family or a private health business. So thank you everyone for joining us. As I mentioned, we're recording this. Um, Emily Waggy will send out a link that will be on our website if you wanna look at it later. So hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you.